Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to the reading of the divine program of the world's history today on this Sunday June 16, 2019, and Yerk Glissman is with me, and we are about to continue in the second portion of the book, obviously. We're well into it now, probably, uh, what would we say, uh, getting closer to two-thirds done through the second portion. And we just finished going through the history of 1870, which is a very, very important time in history, actually. A lot of big changes are in the works, and Yerk, we're going right through it, and we're ready to get the gears rolling again and get the uh, the book reading going and uh, discussion of uh, the, uh, the very interesting and profound history that we are... Uh, what, do you, what would you say? Uh, studying. Yeah, we are going to embark on another journey, I would like to call it. Yeah, um, yes we are. Because every time when we go into this book, it is like stepping on a boat, um, uh, cutting the lines, and then uh, set the sails and see where the spirit takes us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because sometimes correct. we do read a few pages, sometimes we don't, sometimes we just discuss or talk about things, and... That's fine, because that's the way that we like to do this. 
That's the way that I love to do it. That's the way that you like to do it. And that's the way we are going to keep doing it, whether the people like it or not. But this is, our, right. style. This is our style <laughs> of reading books and talking about those books because it is more than just sitting here and making an audio book. It is about getting a deeper understanding. And first and for all, let me emphasize this, please. First and for all, we all have to get a deeper understanding of the Holy Bible, of mm -hmm. which you see here the cover of the original publishing of the 1611 King James Bible. Without the Bible, these book readings are futile. Without the Bible, our, our understanding is nihil, zilch, zero, nothing, is not worth the dirt under your fingernails. Yeah? First, yeah. we have to have the Bible, we have to have the Word of God, because this is the truth, the only truth that exists, and everything needs to be measured against the truth. And if it can stand against the truth, you have to throw it away. And we are, with this book, trying to educate everyone who is following us, I mean, we we are following this author and reading this book. I haven't read this book before. Here and there, I studied a page or two or three in advance. Brett hasn't read it completely before. So we are on the same journey that you are, and we are trying to measure by everything that we read so far in other books and other publications and videos we watched, and measure everything with, that we read here against the Bible, and if it stands in the light of the Bible, it's wonderful, and we embrace this as a new teaching and a new understanding that we got from history that is so corrupted in this world because the only history that we own, that we are taught in this world is the history the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church wants us to know you know the Jesuits forge history but the Roman Catholic Church is longer in existence than the Jesuits and they have been falsifying history from the get-go, where yeah. they went on. That's and true. before that, all the heathen other empires that were there, Grisha, Medo-Persia, and, uh, and Babylon, they all falsified history for their people, because otherwise they couldn't lure them into the wars and the deceptions they needed to extract from the people what they wanted from them. And that is obedience to other gods, and that is their money, and that is their worship. And that's what it's all about. Worship. We are doing this whole study, this whole book reading, this whole understanding to tell you the only God who deserves worship is the only God who, is exi who exists and who is a God. Because all the other quote-unquote gods are no gods. They are images. They are made from stone, they are made from wood, they are made from wax, they are made from I don't know what kind of material. They have ears but don't hear, they have eyes but don't see, they have hands but don't handle, they have feet but don't walk. They are nothing. They are images planted into your brain by the deceiver, Satan, in the first place to tell you there are many gods beside the one and only holy God. And we have to understand his word first, and then we can go into a study of real history, and Albert Close does a very, very good job to bring to us the real undefiled history that stands up against the measurement of the Bible up to where we read now, and this is why we are going to continue today. Any comments, brother? Mm. Go right ahead, Yurk. I'm all ears. Okay. So we took off on page 140 in the book, 140, uh, 114 in the PDF, as you see. Um, we read yesterday to finish uh, on, on comments on Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, the first paragraph that reads, The 70 weeks of years or 490 years from the command of Artaxerxes, the Persian, to restore Jerusalem to the death and atonement of Christ, these and many other events were foretold long before they were fulfilled in real history. And he also gives an example that these are prophecies where a day for a year 
was used. Yeah? So we see this in the ones that we read here before. Yeah, um, mm. uh, The 120 right. years before the flood, the 400 years of bondage in Egypt, all that stuff. So we went through that and now we are going to continue on this page. And as you see, yeah, I prepared two or three pages today. I had a little time. So this is why here and there there's a little color you see and uh, we are going to read this now. Now, one of the most striking and, let me just put the picture here, and chronological periods in the symbolic prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, as we have seen again and again and again, is that of the 40 and 2 months, or the 1,203 score years, or the 3.5 years. These are the periods mentioned in the Bible. Now, skeptics may sneer about the mistakes made by rash and superficial students of prophecy in the past. They have good reason to condemn those who pretended to foretell the exact date of the end of the world and the date of the second coming of Christ, and have thus brought the study of prophecy into contempt. But the great, divinely inspired interpreters of prophecy whose works have been a blessing to the Church of Christ and have stood the test of time did not, N-O-T, they did not fix dates for the second coming of Christ or the end of the world. And who are those wonderful candidates we read about? I only read the green highlighted part of the text because the other one gives the function and titles. I just give you the names. Modern interpreters like Reverend Professor T. R. Burks, Christopher Wordsworth, Reverend S. Candlish, Reverend Dr. A. J. Wiley, which I think should read J. A. Wiley, is it not? James yeah, Aitken correct. Wiley with one L. I don't know if he mistakes him here, uh, his name. But, typo. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. Typo. AJ instead of JA and Wiley with double L. Anyway, mm. if, if here a Dr. AJ Wiley is mentioned whom I don't know, then I will give reference to Dr. James Aitken Wiley, who I know. There we go. Reverend Dr. Keith, Dr. Bickersteth and Cunningham. Sir J. W. Dawson, Reverend A. J. Gordon, Reverend Albert Barnes, Reverend C. H. Spurgeon, Reverend E. B. Elliot, Reverend Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness, and other great students of prophecy did not fix dates for the end of the world and did not fix dates, fix dates for the second coming of Christ. They commented upon them, however, which is an entirely different matter. Now, some scholarly but careless and inaccurate readers and authors speak and write as if all expositors had committed the same foolish blunder as a few unwise interpreters, such, for instance, as the late Reverend M. Baxter, who fixed so many dates, which always went wrong. Mr. Baxter was a futurist. <laughs> and futurism was invented by a Jesuit. No wonder he always went wrong. <laughs> On Baxter, we read this little footnote. One young Presbyterian minister and master who had become unsettled in his faith through association, uh, through associating with the London New Theology advanced thinkers when discussing with the author in 1914 the present-day attitude of the Christian ministry towards the reformers' interpretation of prophecy, dismissed Reverend Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness's works with contempt. He had been two years at Harley College under Dr. Guinness and knew all about his teaching and his mistakes, so he asserted. He knew all about his teaching and his mistakes. Now the author replied, What are about the 50th, uh, the 50th minister I have heard make that statement, yet not one has been able to point out one great mistake? Huh? So you are about the 50th minister, I, I read that wrongly, right? You are about the 50th minister I have heard make that statement, 
yet not one has been able to point out one great mistake. They have heard some careless reader, and often someone who had never read it at all, made the statement and then just repeated it. Brother, isn't that what we are faced with all day in comments? Mm. Oh, under yeah. our videos on YouTube in the in, in the comment section. Surely, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, sorry, I have to sip from my coffee, so I wanted to give you a no, chance no, to fill please. in a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, uh, we do get a lot of comments that uh, that just repeat. Yes. Yeah, that are never based on own research but that are only repeating that someone has heard here or has read there or has seen over there. yeah, Because right. this man said that and that man said that and that's why I tell you that's the way it is. And they never ever took the time to verify their sources of information. yeah. Uh, right. In other words, they speak too soon. Yeah, it's hearsay. Mm -hmm. That's what they are right. doing. And this is exactly what the author here speaks about. Yeah? It says, they have heard some careless reader, and often someone who had never read it all, make the statement, and then they just repeated it. Now you have been at Harley College, and know all about it, you say. You are the very man I'm looking for. Will you give me the specific details of these grand mistakes? So he dares this master who studied under Henry Gretton Guinness and says, I know all of his teachings and all of his mistakes. Now, Albert Close tells him, will you give me specific details of these grand mistakes when you study them all? And then you can surely put your finger on it, can't you? He replied, well, I can't say just now. I don't remember. Of course he did not remember, as he had never really studied the subject. He was only a type of thousands of other careless ministers. He had merely heard so. <laughs> Dear reader, when you hear any man speaking contemptuously of the mistakes of the great scholars and expositors just mentioned, just put a few questions and you will be astonished how carelessly they have read, if they have read anything at all. The carelessness and inaccuracy of some really great scholars has been one of the surprises of the author's life. In most instances, they imagine they were of the same school of interpretation as the late Reverend M. Baxter, the futurist. And this is what the author says here in this footnote, especially goes for people who are trying to demolish the reputation of this book, the 1611 King James Bible. They attack the Bible all way long. They attack the Bible. They attack King James, who gave power to the committee to translate that Bible during, listen closely, seven years from 1604 through 1611. Do you think, don't you think that that is kind of a godly intervention, that it took seven years? from the starting of this committee until they finished the work in 1611? These people are trying to tell you that King James was a, homo uh, was a homophile, or how do you say, a sodomite, biblically, mm -hmm. a homosexual, they say today, that he was a sodomite, that he was a Romanist, that he was this and that, but they can never, ever point to an exact fact in the life of King James. They can never ever point to publications they can use, 
where there is proof of this. The only publications that I have proof of yet is publications of King James himself, where he himself writes against the papacy. Have you ever heard about King James's writing on demonology? I have. I even have the PDF on my computer. And I looked at it, I have to tell you, because I didn't read it, because it's old English, it's very difficult, I take about an hour for a page, but at least I had a look at it, and I read here and there a little bit of it. And that is more than many of these, let them call, scuffers are doing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Verify everything for yourself and measure it against the Bible. Yeah, you're, you know, the scoffers tend to, you know, only oppose what you're putting forward because they just don't want to take the time to go through it all, you know. There is such a thing as being impatient. And I think there's a lot of impatience. In and, and they don't bring proof to the table that no. oppose the points that we make. And that are verifiable. And that are that verifiable that they hold their light or that they hold their stand in the light of the Bible. Never ever. So for that, never ever get discouraged by these people. Because as long as you teach what is in this book, the Holy Bible, you are on the safe path. Okay? That's right. So, let's continue in the book then. The next part goes on the end of the beast's 1200 years reign over the kingdoms of Western Europe in 1870. Um, before we even go into this, let us just remind the listener that it is very, 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 very important that they understand that these quote-unquote ten kingdoms set forth by the Club of Rome in the 1970s is just a preparation to lead you into the lie of the splitting up of Rome into the ten kingdoms as happened in 476. They need this to replay history. And in this book we understand the real history and we know that pagan Rome f uh, fell into ten different king kingdoms in 476 AD. And these ten kingdoms from that time on are the ten horns that are spoken about in the book of Revelation and other places. It is these ten kingdoms. Yeah? It's very important before we go into that that you understand that. What they are telling you today of these ten kingdoms from the Club of Rome or whatever is just so that you have a misunderstanding of real history and that you will follow the futurist agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation chapter 17 verse 17 says, quote, for God hath put in their hearts, speaking of the ten kingdoms of Western Europe, to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, by hating, tearing, and burning the Church of Rome as they have ever since the Reformation, the governments of Europe, whatever may have been their own designs, were actually executing divine judgment on the papacy and its apostate church. And to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Well, God had appointed a time when the political supremacy and power of this beast over the kings of, the, of, of Europe should come to an end. In a footnote we read, until AD 1870, that we spoke about abundantly in the last reading of this book, when the Pope's temporal power fell, papal Rome was a political as well as an ecclesiastical power. 
and as such was represented in the Apocalypse as a blasphemous scarlet-clad beast. The official robes of the Pope as temporal monarch are scarlet in color. In St. Paul's Church in Rome, 109 antichrists, or popes, are pictured in scarlet robes. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, we read, quote, And power was given unto him, speaking of the beast, which is the papal dynasty, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now this is but a miniature symbol of the true period, just as on a map or chart, or chart a scale one inch long marked fifty miles, hundred miles or even five hundred miles, as the case may be, is but a miniature of symbols of the distance so indicated, or, as a beast in Daniel, is but a miniature symbol of an empire. Again, in a footnote, the author explains to us and says, political powers are today, and always have been, represented under the figures of beasts or birds, speaking of, for example, Britain as a lion, Russia as a bear, America an eagle, etc., 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 Scripture elsewhere gives us the scale on which these prophetic miniature periods are to be enlarged. Quote, a year for a day, unquote. Therefore, see Numbers chapter 14 verse 34, Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6, and Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 37. It is evident from the scriptures, and this is the most important <laughs> sentence I've read today, because it verifies everything I said before starting the reading. It is evident from the scriptures. That means that it only stands in the light of the true word of God. And from the marvelous way in which many of these prophetic periods have been already fulfilled in history, on the year-day scale, that the divine mind intended all symbolic prophetic periods to be interpreted on the one given scale, speaking of a year for a day. Forty and two months of thirty days matches 1,203 score days because 40 ti 42 times 30 is uh, 1,203 score, or on the year-day scale, 1,203 score years. The political supremacy of this beast, which succeeded the Roman Caesars, then was to continue not longer than 1,203 score years. Power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, it is a startling fact in the actual history of Western Europe that from its incipient rise in the 7th century to its final fall in 1870, the Pope's temporal power endured 1,203 score years. The Popes regard this as the greatest calamity since the Reformation, and have sulked in the Vatican ever since. He has never since openly shown himself in the streets of Rome, talking about the Pope who has never ever exited the Vatican since 1870, since his temporal power is taken away. So I prepared a little comment here. As Tom Fress spoke about this before, I also stated it numerous times, the Pope made the Vatican his prison, but the keys of that prison are on the inside, until, from the moment of the writing of this book, still in the future, 1929, when we get the healing of the wound. Besides this period of 42 months, there are mentioned in the books of Daniel and Revelation at least 12 other periods of time, which are but miniature symbols of much longer periods. For example, Daniel chapter 7 verses 25 through 27, a time and times and the dividing of time, 1,203 score years. 
Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, the 2300 days, speaking of 2300 years. Yeah, here I have to, of course, give you a little comment. And um, this teaching of the author here is a controversy to the teaching of Nicholas Arthur of First Amendment Radio, who teaches that this prophetic timeline is not a day for a year prophecy, as I personally, me, Jörg, so much want to believe that Nicholas Arthur is true about it. But this subject definitely needs more study. The problem with this interpretation is that different words are used to express the word day. So we read in the Esort, yeah, where you can find the explanation of the, in this case here, Yom, the, the word that I took here from uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, about the weeks. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, in, in Esau, you can see which were the words originally by the Hebrews used of this prophecy. So it says here in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, the original word for day is Ereb. But in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 and verse 12, the word used is Yom. So the point is, when we go to these two parts, uh, you see I, I, I said here mm. 8.14, so this is um, here on number 2, Daniel 8.14, 2300 years. Here the word used is Ereb. And when you go to Daniel chapter 12 here, on number 4, Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 and number 5, Daniel chapter 12 verse 12, a thousand two hundred and ninety days or years, a thousand three hundred and thirty and five days or years, when you go to there, the word used for day is Yom. So, my point that I want to make is that Nicholas Arthur could be right because there are different words used to express the word day. And maybe this one word is speaking about it is a day that we call a 24-hour day and that can be interpreted as a day-year principle, but maybe this other word is not. But therefore, I need more time. I need to look up, for example, Numbers 14.34 and the word that is used there. I need to look up Ezekiel 4, verse 6 and to see which word for day is used there. And, of course, in Daniel 9, I don't need to look that up because that is a different one that is not speaking of word, but that is of uh, speaking of sevens of a week. Yeah? Because in Daniel the, the, the chapter 9, the word day is not used, but the word week is used. Yeah? It's 70 sevens. Yeah? So, therefore, I need more study. But the point is that Nicholas could be right with his explanation. And he is putting it, if I'm not mistaken, on the book of Ezra, in chapter 6, somewhere there. And he speaks mm -hmm. of 2,300 literal days after the, captive, uh, after the caption of the Jews in Babylon, and then returning and building up the temple, and really cleansing out the sanctuary. That's what Nicholas Arthur speaks about. So he could be right, but as I told you, I have not studied the subject enough to fully engage in either interpretation. One thing, <laughs> this is the conclusion, and then of course I want Brett to make a little comment on this. One thing I know for sure, and that is that the explanation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 is sure a bending of the truth, to put it mildly. Oh, yes, Yerk. Are we speaking of 1844? Yes, of course. Ah, oh, boy. You know, I'll never forget when I watched that video on on that subject. Uh, historically, yeah, devastating. Devastating. You know, and it ought to be. It ought to have uh, completely destroyed the Adventist church. In that, and I mean, the Seventh-day Adventist is, is formally known. Um, but uh, it didn't, did it? They rose again with uh, Ellen G. White. I forget what year Ellen G. White came into the 
the uh, focus, and and she uh, wrote this book, uh, the, the Great, Great Controversy. Controversy. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, even the Seventh Day Adventists know that the later publications of Ellen G. White from 1890 something have been falsified. They mm. know that. And Nicholas from Presence of God Ministry, from the SDR Church, always, oops, always points this out um, that. Um, Come on, give me the picture again. Come on, now. <laughs> stupid, me stupid message that pops up there. Um, Nicholas from SDR uh, points that out in all his videos because he has left the Seventh Day Adventist Church. That when you are going to read the books of Ellen G. White, you should read publications probably from before 1890, because afterwards they were hijacked, as he says. Okay, mm. but I don't even care for the writings of Ellen G. White before 1890. Right. I don't even care for a church that is basing um, their inauguration, let's say, on a history of a prophet, a prophecy of Daniel, when they come up with some explanation that no man ever here on earth can verify. The point that I want to make, and I think that Brett is um, full-heartedly consenting with me, is that every Bible prophecy that has been given was fulfilled here on earth and is measurable here on earth in whether historical facts or men or women or whatever coming up, appearing, and we know that the prophecy has been fulfilled. For example, all the prophecies of Jesus Christ have been fulfilled. And for Jesus Christ, there are many, 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 many eyewitnesses among the four Gospels, of course. Um, many more. At least 500 who saw him when he was resurrected and walked the earth and all that stuff. The point that I'm going to make is that every Bible prophecy was measurable here on earth, was fulfilled here on earth, and everybody could see it. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches that the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9 is in heaven when Jesus went from the holy to the most holy and starts his investigative judgment on man. And no man on earth can ever verify that. To me, that is like a Roman Catholic fable of the transubstantiation. When the Roman Catholics tell you that bread is because of the spoken words of the priest, hoc es corpus enemium, now transferred into the divinity, humanity, blood, flesh and uh, spirit and body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a Roman Catholic fable. That is hocus-pocus. And in the same way, I understand this explanation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that the fulfilling of the prophecy of Daniel from 4, 457 BC to 1844 is the 2,300 days, and that is the starting of the investigative judgment of which there is no reference anywhere to be found in the Bible, if I am not mistaken. Right? So when we say here you should measure everything against the Bible, against this wonderful book whose picture you see here, how can I measure that quote unquote um, explanation of the prophecy of Daniel, the Seventh day Adventist teach on the Bible? Where can I see that? And what sense does it make? for Jesus Christ to go from the holy place to the most holy place. And the only thing that I know is that he sits next to the throne of the Father in heaven. That's what's biblical. That's what I can read in the Bible. I don't see anywhere that Jesus goes from the holy place to the most holy place and starts an investigative judgment and doing what? Judging people who are not there? Uh, wh what is the resurrection for? And the last judgment? When the believers in Christ, the saints 
and all the wicked come out of their graves and are being judged in the final judgment. What's that for? What is that investigative judgment for? That Jesus Christ is now busy with for almost 180 years. Come on! Don't you see how ridiculous that is? Or is it just me who is that ridiculous? Please, Brett, help no. me out here. No, 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 no. Yeah, you're, uh, it's the Millerites, actually. Millerite movement of 1844. They were following this teaching of this William Miller, uh, who in 1833 first shared publicly his belief that the second advent of Jesus Christ would occur roughly in the year 1843 through 1844. And obviously, he's a false prophet. So That's why that, I didn't even go into that, because he said Jesus right. Christ would come back, but he didn't come back. So, oh, of we, can, course. we can throw of that course. out, of course. But, but then they started their teaching of the investigative judgment, didn't they? Yeah, so I don't know how this came about. Um, and, you know, this is why we study history, is to kind of take a look at... Uh, you know, how on earth did this Millerite movement morph into the Seventh-day Adventists? I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to take a look at it right now very briefly. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a disturbing bunch of uh, principles that we're dealing with here because, first of all, Calling Ellen G. White a prophet or calling anyone a prophet these days is, first off, wrong. Because the Bible is finished with yep. the writing of the book of Revelation by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos between 95 and 96 AD at the end of the very first century. And when the Bible is closed, Elvis has left the building. There are no yeah, more that's prophets right. to You're come. But I think what gets confusing, okay, for me at least, I'll just be a little personal here, is that, yeah, people can speak about prophecy, yes, but it doesn't mean they, per se, are prophesying. It's the words and the testimony of Christ that prophesy, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so unless we have a biblical reference and, and we are reading straight from the book, uh, there's something wrong here. Something terribly wrong. And, uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's up to us as individuals to just walk away. You know, when that starts going on, uh, you just get out of there. Just, you know, don't give it too much time. <laughs> don't give it too much energy, you know. Energy is precious. Use it wisely. You know, save save your uh, your uh, energy for bigger battles to fight because this battle is uh, obviously uh, been lost. That you know, a false teacher will lose. Always, when you hold them against the righteous teacher, which is Jesus Christ, yeah, the yeah. false will always lose, but. Listen, I didn't even start about the Millerite movement because I know that's another uh, box of worms uh, we are going to. Open right, there. but we were talking about 1844, so but that's we were I just about wanted to clarify. And of course, I just these, want to clarify that. That's yeah, all. but it's it's in 1844. Of course, these events fall together because the Millerite quote unquote prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ, 1843, 1844. Well, first he said 1843, and then he said 1844. Yeah, he changed right. his mind. Yeah, when the one date came and passed, he said another. And out of that movement, then later on, I don't know exactly how. I don't even care how the Seventh Day Adventist movement came out, and then they interpreted, oh, but this was the moment when Jesus Christ left the holy place in the temple in heaven and went to the most holy place, and now he's holding his investigative judgment. Well, it, it just goes to show you, Yerk, when, when you start a, uh, a movement like this based on false prophecy, you have to go somewhere else with that movement. And that's where they went, was to this, uh, this Adventist. And that's why everything has such a horrible taste when you speak about Seventh-day Adventists in that sense. They have a horrible history here, and when people hear it, they're just like, oh, 
yeah, the Adventists, yeah, they're wrong. They're way off, you know? And people get really upset about it. And, well, yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's, to me, it's, it's no big deal. It's just another false prophet like the others, you know? There was, there's a whole bunch of false prophecy going around. Oh, you got many uh, nothing more false new. prophets than you have real prophets, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Way, way, way more. Way more false prophets than the real. I mean, you know, you just... I think the historicist point of view is the real deal. I really do. The more I study it, the more I realize how wrong everything else is. Oh, there's no alternative to the historicist point of view of nope. prophecy. That's no question. Nope. Yep, that's, that's no correct. question of all. Okay, let's. I, I didn't want to break uh, or start with a with a discussion about this point. I just wanted to make the points when the author tells us here that the 2,300 days, like in all the other prophecies, and then that's very important, and all the other prophecies tells as a day year prophecy. Then Nicholas Arthur, with his explanation of that, is in this case only meant by days and leads to the book of Ezra then his explanation must be wrong. And where can we say that the Seventh-day Adventists are wrong? Is, for example, they pin the starting of the 2,300 days on the same date as in Daniel chapter 9, the prophecy Daniel makes on the coming of Jesus Christ, on the first coming and the going to the cross and... Um, when on the cross, um, um, ending the sacrifices and oblations, yeah, the sacrifices and oblations, ending that, they put that on the same date. But I am very sorry, even though I heard many Seventh Day Adventist teachers about this, Walter Feit and many others, Bill Hughes, speaking about this stuff, I never saw biblical proof. That the 2,300 day year period has the same starting point as has the 490 year prophecy. And if it has another starting point, then it may be fulfilled earlier, or it may be still is to be fulfilled. I don't know. Who can exactly tell us? Because when they say, oh, because of the prophecy that Daniel got in chapter 8, and then he felt bad in his stomach, he was ill, you know, and when he went better, Gabriel came again and gave him the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, and that's why it all started together. That's what the Seventh-day Adventists teach you. I say that explanation to me is baloney. I don't believe it because I don't see biblical proof in there. So, the starting point of the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel 8 verse 14 is the same starting date as the biblical prophecy of the 490 uh, week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. That is just an explanation from the Seventh day Adventists to match their agenda. It doesn't give me, Jörg, the satisfaction to believe that, to understand that that prophecy was fulfilled in 1844. And you probably remember from uh, some readings on beforehand, we read that in 1843, 1844, we had the Edict of Toleration. Yeah, and that's that the it. Edict of Toleration that started the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire that was finished in 1919, 75 years after that, was an explanation of that. I don't know in what matter this edict of toleration is to be measured to Daniel chapter 8, speaking of the cleansing of the sanctuary. I don't know that. I don't have the understanding yet. But I can tell you that that teaching or that information is so interesting that at least... If you are an honest scholar of history and of the Bible, 
the story of the Seventh day Adventist needs more time to be clarified, needs more time to be studied, needs more time to be examined, and you have to put different explanations against each other and then sift out the ones which are true, which which holds in the in the in the in the light. Oh, sorry, I got a got a sneeze here. Yeah, yeah. Which, please which, do. which holds which holds light against the Bible. <coughs> sorry. Bless you. Which holds light against the Bible, you know. And that's all I'm going to say. So I'm not I'm not doing a controversy here. Yeah? It's surely not a great controversy. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I'm just telling you uh. that the truth only is to be found in the Bible and that neither I nor Brett, who we are here, nor Michael, if he would join us, have the right understanding of biblical prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. We don't have the right understanding of the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist because it is so filled with lies that you don't see the truth through all the lies because they are so convincing, you know. But the devil is also very convincing, right? Yay. Oh, yes. Yay. Hath God really said? Huh? And that's the problem that you have here. And I do not want to rely on anything but the Holy Spirit that leads me into all truths. So... What do I do if I have a contention like that? That's probably the same thing that Brett does. I put the subject aside. I give it some rest. I give it some further study in the future. And I be patient and trusting in the Lord that when He will reveal the truth about that matter to me, then He will reveal due in His time. Not according to my will, not according to my understanding, but according to His will, because it is His will that's been done. Amen. Amen. Right, Brett? That's right. So, and with that said, let's continue in the book. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, speaks about the 70 weeks, 490 years. So this is not, as I said, an explanation of uh, a the, the word... Um, uh, day, because as you can see in Daniel 9, it says about 70 weeks, and that the word is used is Shabua, that is properly passive participle as a denominative, literally seven, that is a week specifically of years seven or a week. This is not a word for day, yeah, so that's why it not completely fills this summation of the author here. But then again, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 and verse 12, we have uh, 1,290 days or years, and in verse 12, 1,335 days or years. And then we go from Hebrew to uh, Greek, because we change into the book of Revelation, and that is of the New Testament, and that has been written in, um, in Greek, that is a completely different uh, language. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, we read of the ten days, and that is uh, very understandable for people who, uh, who uh, study history. Um, the ten days of persecution that Jesus Christ speaks about in Revelation chapter 2, and that those were the days between 303 and 313, that ended with the Edict of Constantine, and then in 321, and you know the story. Okay? That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 15, it speaks of a day, a month, and a year. That, uh, prophetically, is a day is a year, a month is 30 years, and a year is 360 years. And when you count that up, you come to sum up 391 years. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, we speak again of 40 and 2 months. 1260 or three score as I prefer to say actually when I think of it years mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 speaks of a thousand two hundred and three score days or years Revelation chapter 11 verse 9 speaks of three days and a half three and a half years Revelation chapter uh, 12 verse 6 speaks of a thousand two hundred three score days 1,260 years. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, speaks of time, times, and a half a time. Again, 
1203 score years. And finally, Revelation chapter 18, verse 5 speaks of 40 and 2 months. Again, 1203 score years. Now, God meant these chronological periods to be used, else, what was the use of giving them? In Reverend Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness's book Approaching End of the Age, and in his Light for the Last Days, a full and detailed exposition of these prophetic periods on the year-day scale is given. Dr. Guinness in these works clearly demonstrates that the great hilltops of history, in so far as they concern the Jews and the Christian Church and the papal and Mohammedan powers from the days of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel in 600 BC to the present day, have been separated by one or other of the above prophetic periods. He also clearly demonstrates that the reason why so many students of prophecy have made such dreadful blunders, and here of course you can count the Seventh-day Adventist Church among them, is that they have in many instances fixed on wrong starting points. What did I tell you about the starting point of Daniel 8.14? and dogmatically predicted the exact dates of future events and have mapped out the future experiences of the Jews and other nations far more definitely than the Word of God does. Because it fits their agenda. For them, it needs to fit their agenda. It does not need to fit God's agenda, it needs to fit their agenda. And here we are again with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They also dogmatically predicted the exact dates of quote-unquote future or past events, 1844, and have mapped out the future experiences of the Jews and other nations far more definitely than the Word of God does. Listen, brother, we come to an, another subject here, lunar calendar and solar years. I would <laughs> very much like to keep that for the yes. next reading because this has Wonderful. been... This Perfect. Has been, yeah, this has been an extensive reading today, at least for me. I'm, I'm really exhausted about this because yeah. you, know, you don't want to say no anything doubt. wrong. And, and don't get me wrong on the Seventh-day Adventist Church now. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is an apostate church like the Lutherans, like the Methodists, yeah, like the Calvinists, right. like the Baptists, like all the other churches. If you are within the Seventh-day Adventist Church and you think that you are in the one and only rightful church of Jesus Christ, think again. You are not, okay? And every little, every church, every denomination has its faults, has its problems. Whether we were able today to show some problems of the Seventh-day Adventist Church or not, we were wrong, I don't know. But there are wrongs in that church. And one of the biggest wrongs of that church is that they accept a woman as a biblical prophetess. And that is something that I can never go along with. And you are not accepted in the church except you accept the prophetess of Ellen G. White. Well, that's the same the Roman Catholic Church does because you don't have a say in the Roman Catholic Church if you do not accept that the Virgin Mary is the perpetual immaculate virgin. Right? And that is a wrong teaching, because she is only the physical mother of our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth, but in Roman Catholic understanding, in the esoteric understanding, she is the Queen of Heaven. She is the Babylonian Queen of Heaven. And if you don't accept their teaching, then you have nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. And if you don't accept Ellen G. White as the prophetess, as the prophetess of the SDA Church, then you have nothing to do with the Seventh-day uh, Seventh Adventist Church. They even throw you out. They set ultimatums and throw you out of there. And I speak of experience, not personal experience, but I know a person who has just experienced this. I don't even need to call his name. Brett knows who I'm talking about. He knows who I'm talking about. And that's more than enough. Okay, mm -hmm. there is something definitely wrong with the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the true body of Christ is a believer here and a believer there, scattered all over the world. We are the visible body and Jesus is the head. The Seventh-day Adventists with their general congregation that is, by the way, led by a Jesuit-trained 
guy for years and years now. If you want to adhere to that church, fine. Your point. Don't come to my channel. Don't watch my videos. But if you open up your mind and want to learn outside of the realm of that church and want to really measure everything against the Bible, then you're always welcome here. And I try to help you as much as I can. But I don't have all the understanding. Brett doesn't have all the understanding. Tom Fress doesn't have all the understanding. Nicholas Arthur doesn't have all the understanding. Bill Hughes doesn't have all the understanding. And Walter J. Fight doesn't have all the understanding. Certainly not. The only one who has all understanding is the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Until next time, Maranatha. Thanks, Jörg. Yeah, our real teacher, Jesus Christ, in spirit and in truth. In prophecy and history, and that's what we study. You know, it's not that we're trying to um, belittle anybody or anything like that. We're just trying to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. And that's really what it's about. It's about doing your research. It's about figuring the the little points out and uh you know approaching them and and sharing them with the world too yerk you know it's not about keeping it in uh, holding everything in and it's certainly not about uh rising above others no if anything we need to fall down at the feet of our lord jesus christ cuz he's going to take care of all of it he is the potter we are the clay we are not iron God forbid if we were, because those iron vessels are going to be destroyed very soon. And, you know, all of this talk about updating and upgrading and all this stuff, it gets into this kind of thinking that we have to be rising, uh, you know, higher up in some kind of hierarchy or something. Come on now. The Lord told us that we need to die to self daily. That means not to exalt self. That means to humble yourself to the Lord and to his teaching so he can actually teach us, so we can actually listen, because listening is very, very important. Without any degree of, of listening and comprehension, we're not going to get anywhere at all. We're only going to get in bigger trouble. And that is not the point of the Brett Norman YouTube channel here and Yerk's Juggler 66 channel. If anything, we are just here to shed the light of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we try to do to the best of our ability. So with that being said, we'll catch up with you next time. God bless. Bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil, one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, 
For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.